All right, welcome back to part two with Wendy Whitman. This is the Tell It Like It Is podcast, and this is your host, Alexi Bailey. Thank you for staying with me, Wendy. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to Wendy. She's in Portugal. She is a U.S. born who is traveling the world, living her best life. And we're kind of reflecting on the early days and everything that led up to this. And really what we're doing here is we're really trying to tap in to this human experience, right? You, when you're born, you're born into your body and you don't know what's going on. You just start crying, someone sticks a bottle in your mouth and you just get kicked out of the hospital, go figure it out. You know, so, so much of this is kind of like happening to us. And like I was saying in part one, people are throwing messages at you and then you get to a point where you're out of alignment. And I think that's what you were saying. You just kind of slapped around, thrown around, you know, here's school, go here, this is life, here's religion. And, you know, you had um, a, a life altering experience where you, your brother passed away and you're all like, wait a minute, you know, who am I? What does this mean? Like, I think that's what you were saying, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so everything, my, my direction changed at that point. Um, before that, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do professionally. I had taken classes in sociology, but I'd also taken a lot of art classes and I was just bouncing. But after I got, after I got the acupuncture treatment, I definitely knew I'm going to be an acupuncturist. That's it, case closed. Yeah. Where was this? Um, I got the first acupuncture treatments in New York City. Um, the person who gave them to me was a nurse. Um, and she was also trained at an acupuncture college in London, I think, somewhere in England, Worsley School of Acupuncture. And um, that was in the 80s. And at that time, acupuncture wasn't a licensable profession in the US because you needed to have a medical license to put a needle into someone, but there was no acupuncture license. So a doctor or a nurse could legally put acupuncture needles in someone with no training at all. Doesn't mean they knew what they were doing, but a person who'd been to acupuncture school couldn't do it legally, it was a felony. But my acupuncturist was legal because she was a nurse. So. Where did you go to college? Um, I went to college originally in Chicago to Northeastern University um, and Columbia College I graduated from. It's not Columbia University in New York. It's an art school in Chicago. Got it. Um, so what prompted you to go to New York? Um, well, the fashion industry was there and I liked the idea of not needing a car and I knew the subways were developed and there was a big city. It had a lot of arts. So I put all those pieces together and just decided, let me do this. Now, it sounds like you've always been like independent. Like you just like, I'm moving to New York. I'm traveling the world, like, right? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I don't feel it, you know, because I, I guess in my, in my true, true self, I would be even more like that. Because for 30 years, I was an acupuncturist and I really couldn't leave my patients for that long. So I feel like I was, I was blocked in by that. But if I look at the whole picture, I think, yeah, I have definitely just made decisions and done what I wanted a lot um, and moved around, yeah. Um, so in the break, you were asking me about um, the podcast. Mm -hmm. In the break, you were asking me about the podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, I started at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm getting close to 30 interviews. And basically, I've just always had conversations that I felt were rich and relevant. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like we were so far from our potential. And, you know, most people are kind of just passive about it, about their feelings. And I just felt like if I could give these, these conversations that I was having a platform, you know, maybe it can, I can rally people around it or get more involved with people who are rallying and just, just be a part of that solution and mm -hmm. you know, take it on more seriously. You know, I think America is due for a revival. And I think that um, there's enough people here to really like do something amazing. And I think we just need to get each other's attention and, you know, move together, you know? So you might have someone over here who's doing something nice and someone over there doing something nice, but we need to, you know, instead of having 10 people in the, sh in the park, you know, if 200 people showed up, then the next week it'd be a thousand. And by the end of the month, it'd be 10,000. And people would say like, why am I going home to sit in the dark to eat unhealthy food and watch Netflix? I can go be in community in Central Park. I can go to my local thing and meet people and be alive. And so I just, I feel like we're getting more and more closed in and it's all voluntary, right? It's not chains, it's not guns. We're just voluntarily going home, sitting inside, sitting still, eating unhealthy food, consuming unhealthy media, and I'm sometimes when I think about it too deeply, I feel a little bit overwhelmed. I'm like, am I the only one who sees this? Like, it's just getting darker and darker, you know? So I said, if I could have a podcast to kind of illuminate the voices and say, you're not the only one who feels like that. If you feel like that, let's meet up, you know? And my goal is for the podcast to be a place where you know, in the comment section, people can tag their city and meet in the park tomorrow. Like, you know, healthcare sucks, you know, and even good healthcare is not that good. And if you're undocumented and, you know, so mm -hmm. not only do you have a messed up system, you're isolated at the same time and you're afraid of your next door neighbor who you haven't okay. spoken to. And it's just this weird cloud that, you know, America is not fun and happy you know so we we really have to like own it and do our part and and be willing to show up you know and in a lot of ways I feel like people are afraid of me as the other like you know if you just go into a space and say hey I'm friendly and I just want to be here with you guys and there's so much skepticism now so all of these things are just like why me and and I just want to help do my part and and highlight the conversation mm -hmm. well there's such a need for that i mean it's hard to have an honest conversation actually because there is and there's intentional polarization and especially it's gotten i think even worse with covid the polarization so now people that were friends are even splitting apart over COVID issues. So it, it's definitely getting worse. Yeah, yeah. So, so I hope the podcast can contribute to, like you're saying, wait, you know, arousing people to be aware that they're not the only ones that, that feel like that. Yeah, my, my goal is diverse voices. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy for me to get a small group of like-minded people, but the idea is to, you know, people are more trustworthy of people who look like them. You know, mm -hmm. you're more likely to gravitate to someone your age, you know, someone with your background, like those kinds of things. So I'm, I'm also challenging that and saying, you know, let's mm -hmm. break down all of these little barriers, you know, let the Jewish group hang out with the Muslim group and let's have a free-spirited coming together and and I do think like I said a revival has to happen you know I think people mm -hmm. are feeling it they just they just need a venue to say let's meet here mm -hmm. and pockets are doing that so there's a group called no more lonely friends 
Mm -hmm. um, it was started by a young person who was having trouble with her friendships, you know? So mm -hmm. there's so many little things that are these, these rays of hope. And I'm, I'm just excited. I am positive. I am optimistic. But the people need to act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you if you ever come back to the state, if you ever want to come back to the states, you're welcome to come to Princeton. Thank you. <laughs> it's not that far from the city, and you know you can fly into Philly or Newark. Just let me know. All right. Um, I'm actually going back. Um, we started, we were talking about the vaccine situation here. And I just decided that even though I'm not wanting to fly unvaccinated right now, um, the easiest way for me to get vaccinated is to go back and get my get a vaccine. So I am going back relatively shortly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah so, you know, the Tell It Like It Is podcast is a part of in person is it's it's rooted in in person community although you know i'm zooming with people all over the world it's rooted in in person community so wherever you are you know you should form some your own in person community and participate in other people and invite them in that kind mm -hmm. of thing. so it's all about just promoting those kinds of things you know they have um a new web a website called couch surfing oh yeah I, i'm on that one yeah so there's there, there are these beautiful things you know like i said activism in the 21st century we have to use these tools and we have to get over the fear of the other right so a lot of people will say you know i'm afraid to go to a stranger's couch because they're weird or crazy and there's always a bad story but the reality is we have to jump over those hurdles right. otherwise though that although i will say that a lot of single women have had very bad experiences with that site so that's also caveat and tour you know check your inner vibes I, the people that i stayed with in canada they had couch surfers there and you know, we would have dinner together and it was always like a nice experience. But if if you are a woman going alone, very much screen who you're don't don't just trust that it's going to be OK. And that's the other thing. We need to create systems that are trustworthy, you know, mm -hmm. and if you ask if I was more tech savvy, that's something I really want to do is create an app that promotes connection you know, not an app for TikTok dances or posting food, but an app that's really, you know, we're all on Facebook, but somehow you go on Facebook and look at other people's lives and you kind of stay in your box. So an app that really gives people a chance to come together. And another, another place that I look sometimes is meetup.com. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of this? Yeah, yeah. So some, I, to me, meetup.com, I really like that, that, that. That's an example of something I think that could po possibly work, you know? Uh -huh. If more people used it and it was just more open to everyone. Yeah, there were meetup groups in my old neighborhood when I lived uptown in Manhattan and I went to a few of them. And that was fun. And I think it's just that people don't know about it that much because it, it seemed to be able to connect people around activities. Right, exactly. Wow. Well, I'm a fan of it. I'm a fan of it. Um, I find that the people on there, they're not very active. So, so it's like, it's hit or miss. It's, it, it's hit or miss. It's not easy to just, like, if you put out an event, everyone just finds it and shows up. You kind of like, you'll have... 500 people see it and one person will show up and it's like it's so I think the heyday for that's still coming so let me let me say how we met right in yeah. in 20 in some time it might, it might have been 2013 I, I I I'm a runner I run marathons I was talking to a runner friend and they mentioned shape up NYC 
and they said if you go to shape up ny shape up nyc they'll tr they'll train you to be a fitness instructor for free they'll help you to get a fitness class for free and you will be in a you will be um serve, serving the community right. so when when they told me about it i instantly gravitated towards it i signed up i wrote an essay they got back i was selected joined the class trained me to be a fitness instructor they were all amazing i remember blake linda um they were really good people it's a great yeah. it's a great program yeah really good program um i think the only downside to that is you're a shape up instructor but at some point i think you should start to get a stipend at least yeah or i mean Use it as a springboard to get other work if that's what you want to do. Right, right. I, but, you know, I so so after we finished the training, uh, me and Wendy, we got placed in a senior citizen program in Harlem. So we were working together sometimes on the same day, sometimes alternating days. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the seniors and, you know, for them, this was a huge, it was great to have someone there leading the fitness class. And, you know, we did chair fitness, you know, I played jazz, we did a little yoga and, you know, these people didn't have access to that. You know, they didn't have access to planet fitness. They, they, they were, they needed the activity. This was like the only activity they got once a week. Right. And Alexi's class was more, a little more aerobic oriented and mine was more yoga oriented, but they liked both of them. Yeah, we made it work. You know, I loved it. So this was 2014. Um, I, I was just continuously doing the class. And the only reason I stopped was because I started doing Runners United, which was a community based run run oriented activity social club mm -hmm. and it was just like one more thing to juggle and i i gave all my attention to that but i really missed it and i wished i hadn't stopped and i still i would gladly start it again locally in in um princeton that's great and i went on and took um another yoga training and in my yoga training, it was like a 200 hour training plus homework. Um, so it was a more intense program than the shape up. And I had to do an internship, which I did at an organization for mentally handicapped adults. Yeah. And then I ended up teaching a type of yoga that also had a lot of mantras, which is like hand positions and I'm um, sorry, mudras are hand positions and mantras, which is chanting um, and, and some, some actual yoga with postures and they loved it. It was that, I, I loved teaching that class. That was my favorite and working with them was really incredible. That was one thing that I really missed about when I left New York was working with, with that group of people. But. Well, hopefully you'll, once you get grounded and the COVID restrictions are better, you'll have all the classes you want going, you, yeah. you're gonna have those. Yeah, definitely. I, I would look forward to doing that again, for sure. Um, we we kind of touched on this word before, awakening. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean to you? Oh, um, I, to me, it's looking at your own bigger picture and your brighter self, not being confined by what's around you immediately, not, allow, not allowing your mind to be blocked by your surroundings. Um, like you had mentioned, 
we say America is the best, the US is the best with this, that, and the other. But when you look at some of the data, it doesn't really support that. But a lot of people won't look at that data. And that's like a really simple thing. Or in terms of health, a lot of people won't look at the data that, you no, know, you can't eat processed foods all the time and not have chronic health issues when you're older. Um, people won't, you know, uh, not everybody, obviously, but awakening means being able to look at what this really means. What does it mean to my life if I eat white bread and, and you know, Campbell's soup every day? What, what does that mean? what does that look like compared to what it'll look like 40 years from now if I'm eating vegetables and fish, you know? It's just being able to think about different things. Um, when you were growing up, did your parents give you religion? No, we didn't have much religion in the household. So did you what's your spiritual practice do you have one um well i meditate um and i feel most connected with eastern religions um buddhism hinduism um of course in the acupuncture there's a lot of systems of acupuncture, but the most medical systems are completely material. They're not spiritual at all. But if you go back in the history of acupuncture, which is thousands of years old, it's deeply connected with Taoism. Um, so there actually are, ultimately acupuncture became a spiritual practice for me because there are ways to work with the energy that are consistent with Taoist philosophies. Um, so you're, you're closest to a Taoist? No, I would not say that. I would say it just a hodgepodge of various, because I, I just finished a, the, the Swami that I went to India to study with, and then I had to leave India. I just did a training with him online, finally, um, on pranayama, which is a type of yogic breath, and mudras. We did mudras and mantras like I'm doing from the other yoga, but the pranayama was the intensive part of it. And that's all yoga-based, but not necessarily, yoga is not necessarily Hinduism. It's like a offshoot of it like not all not all yogis are hindu and not all hindus do yoga right. but but there's a connection put it like that um a strong connection and and then when i was in thailand it's very buddhist and i felt very comfortable going to the buddhist temples so I'd say any any Eastern religion, any not like because they're all. I think they're all more accepting. They're not monotheistic. Um, I have, I I try. I I do believe that every religion has something of value. So like here in Portugal, there's a lot of um, churches, and I'll go sit in a church and meditate or pray. I don't object to it, but I feel. I feel more connected with religions that are not monotheistic. It's my natural inclination. So, so um, most people, most people won't even go to this level, right? But um, I try to understand spirituality because spirit, for most people, spirituality means religion, right? And and it's deeper than that, right? I think spirituality mm -hmm. and religion is a way of understanding your connection to oneness, your connection to the divine, right? So when you really start to tease out these things, you know, Jesus was teaching you about your relationship to the divine. Right. But the way Christianity looks at it is, let's focus on Jesus. And I think Jesus was more trying to say, 
something about the divine and your connection to it. And yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, Christianity says, no, 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 let's look at Jesus. And mm -hmm. they're like studying the man and they're kind of taking away from the actual message of the man, right? And they're focused on his mother and like all of these things that kind of sidetrack you from just your connection to the divine. And then mm -hmm. people start to argue about where he was born and what, and like, no, none of that matters. It's just about your connection to the divine. So mm -hmm. I think it's less about monotheistic versus um, belief in many gods and just an understanding that the divine is unknowable and you need to rev reverence yourself to know yourself and, right. to, and to see your connection to it. Right, exactly. To be able to experience that within yourself. Um, because even many gods is again, outside yourself. Exactly. And somehow we have to recognize that it's inside of us as well. I mean, it's outside, but it's inside too. If it's not inside, um, we're not living it in the same way. But I think the thing for me is that like whatever religion people are, sometimes that message gets across. Like you can go into a Christian church and, and feel this deep energy I, and connection. And then you can go into another church and it's not there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Two people in the same building, one can feel it and the other one can't. So it's not even the building. It's about what works for you. Right. And finding what works for you. Exactly. Exactly. I grew up um, Seventh-day Adventist Christian and I think a lot of emphasis is placed on the book, understanding, you know, all of the physical things. And mm -hmm. I think the simplicity of the message can be overlooked. There's a lot of people out there who knows the book very well. They know all of the scriptures. They know the stories. They, they're able to break it down. But just the simplicity of your connection to the divine they miss that, you know, if, if I'm not praying to Jesus, then God can't hear me. If I don't believe in Jesus, God doesn't, God is not going to save me. Like all of these things, I think, just take away from the simplicity. It's scary to me, actually. <laughs> why, should, why should you have to have one specific belief system to be saved or to be a good person? It, um, could you not, I mean, the person who accepts that belief system and does bad things, are they more likely, are, are, are they better than someone who maybe is an atheist, but does charitable things every day? Who, who you are in your daily life is important as well, as much as any belief system. My wife's mentor, um, her name was Barbara Joseph. She was one of the biggest activists and a big influence for my wife and myself. She taught at the college we were at and she was like in the streets on fire. She loved people. She was like everything you'd imagine, you know, and she's like, no, I'm an atheist. And that like blew our minds at the time. And it was just like, we couldn't like, <laughs> you know, um, it's a journey and, and I, want, I want to help people wake up, you know, and like I said, so much of who we are is just scripted and handed to us. And if you deviate from that script, you're punished by society. And that's a lot of the problems that we're dealing with right now. There's a lot of people out there who are good Christians and they're giving non-binary um, LGBT people a hard time because of what they think the Bible says. And none of that is of God. None of that is of the divine, you know? And that's, those are the simple things that I try to highlight to people and have people look at the bigger picture, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who don't go to church, but because they know, because they have some idea about 
church god religion and that mm -hmm. god is against homosexuality they kind of think it's okay so it's not like they're going to church or they read that themselves they're just kind of like following some general idea out there mm -hmm. and punishing others kicking their kids out because they don't even go to church but they're kicking their kids out because they want to be in a same sex or non-binary situation. And it's like tearing us apart, you know, and that's the reason why I talk about spirituality and religion is because I want people not just to blindly follow some narrative that you're given. I want you to really think like, what does the divine care about? You know, religion shouldn't be denouncing anyone. It should just be your way of helping you to understand the divine. Not a right. book for you to use to punish other people. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm a I'm a Christian, and 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 I I feel like I can see that clearly, and I know other Christians do too. But I know you know people like like from your parents' generation who had very strong beliefs, and they thought because the the pastor said it or the pastor agreed with them mm -hmm. that it's okay to hate blacks. It was okay to hate all these groups of people. And it was like said in church, you know, the pastor was encouraging segregation and right. you with your pastor, you know, to keep those people out of your school. Yeah, and, and then if you even think about it, that the majority of spiritual belief systems over the course of time and the majority of people who have ever lived, therefore, believed in transmigration of souls or reincarnation. Um, and if there is such a thing as transmigration of souls, then it's very likely that the person that you hate in this life is the person you'll be in the next life. So hopefully we could realize like, <laughs> let's get it together because if I'm taking this out on that person, then I'm gonna be reborn as that person, or at least it's a possibility. Maybe I won't, maybe there's no such thing as reincarnation and I'm, but I'm connected to that person on some other level where if they go down, I go down, but I just don't see it from here, you know? So yeah, it's a, there's some bigger picture going on. <laughs> I think not many people will, will acknowledge that I'm a racist and I hate black people or I hate this group. Most people won't say that. I think at this point, it's gotten to a point where it's subconscious and they just, they, they, they're comfortable in their position. They're comfortable with their circle and they just have a general sense of otherness when it comes to people outside of their group. Mm -hmm. I don't think, me personally right now, I live in the Northeast. I don't think racism is, is the big problem. I think it's that villainization of the other you know, that fear of the other, you know, what would happen if you made friends with a Mexican immigrant who just got here? You know, what would happen if you invited them to your home? What would happen if you went to their church? You know, what would happen if you championed their cause? You know, we care enough when it's on TV or in the newspaper, you know, when, 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 when um, we're separating kids from their parents at the Texas border, people see it on TV and they're like, oh man, that's terrible. I hope Biden does something. And they just kind of like, you know, I think all of that blood is on our hands. Agreed. Regardless of where you live or who you voted for, like you, we have to, we have to step up, you know, you can't just see the news and just go about your business. Mm -hmm. And so your podcast is to bring awareness and let people know that they're not the only ones feeling these things, make it a safer place to even talk about these things. Safe space. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the immigrants come across the border. I get it. 
you know, why take the kid away from the mom? You know, and now you have a four-year-old in a cage. Yeah, no, this is, this is just about hurting people. It's, I mean, it's unnecessary to do that. It's about inducing pain. And I, the, I, think, I hope we've gotten past that. The minute that hits the news, like we should all be like, come on, you know, that should have been a scandal within itself, you know? So there's so many little things. I, I can list them all. I have to touch on Nepal, right? And maybe you can say it for me. There's, um, there was a practice in Nepal where people would sell their kids into labor. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with this? Yes, I actually volunteered in an agency that um, in Nepal that um, worked with the trafficked children who were now returning to the community. But um, first of all, they're, they're hungry. They're farmers. Um, the situation is changing. They can't make enough money. They can't make enough food to feed their family. And there are problems with like um, migrant laborers that have never, tribal people basically, but settled tribal people that don't have land ownership. Then the Nepali government says that, well, we own this land. Well, these people have lived there for forever. They don't have deeds, but they live there in the dry season and plant. And then in the rainy season, they have to move because it might get flooded. And so they move somewhere else. Well, now if the government of Nepal says, you don't have a deed for this land, um, so you, we're gonna put our buildings here. So now that disrupts their agriculture. And then somebody comes along and says, well, don't worry about it. You can't feed your daughter right now, but I'll take good care of her. And they're like, well, it's true. My daughter is skinny, she's hungry, she's not going to school. And this person says they'll take care of her. And then they realize only later that their kid is working, you know, 20 hours a day and not going to school and not eating. And it, it, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't done with knowledge. Um, and it wasn't done with a lot of options. I mean, they're not selling their children because they're bad people. Right. They're, they're hungry people that don't understand what's going to happen to their children. And fortunately, the, the organization that I worked with, which is, um, well, volunteered with, which is called Creating Possibilities. And there's another one I think called Her. Um, and they have a, a building now called Unako House. They have almost all um, bonded laborers that they call it, they, they don't call it like when they're trafficked, they call it bonded labor. Mm -hmm. So they have mostly all people that were bonded laborers that are now working there. They have microfinance so they can get into their own businesses. They have education. There's um, focus on sending the girls to school. So they're doing like really good work. And so hopefully it's gonna change. But yeah, I mean, it's been really hard times for people that have to go through that. And I, I was at, in one part of Nepal, I saw where the river was and how, how that river flooded seasonally and how these people had to move because these are people that were where I was that time they still had the privilege to move back and forth on their traditional lands but once that's gone they they're stuck yeah. you know? so many of the things that are happening in the world are interrelated you know the fact that we're so privileged here you know and and we're benefiting from 
the labor all over the place. There's so many injustices. Um, I, I really want us to just A, be appreciative because America is a safe, is a relatively safe place, you know, where you can get food and education and try to put it in perspective and understand your privilege, you know, who, who much is given, much is expected and um, care about our brothers and sisters around the world and, and our, our, be mindful of our, the impact of our actions, you know, mm-hmm. what we're doing here and how we, you might get, you might get cheap clothes from Old Navy, but that means there's a kid somewhere who's making that sweater. Right. We can't just get the five ninety nine nine ninety sale and never think about it. You know, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. And and we have like six hundred sweaters. We give them away. We donate them. Like we're just buying it, throwing it away, and you know, it's it's an there's a lot of things that we know we can do better. So mm-hmm. I continue to challenge myself and challenge my audience and really try to wrap our minds around it. Um, are you, are you, you're going to be doing your yoga. You're going to be doing acupuncture. Do- uh, acupuncture license is not transferable. Mm. So like the amount of, effort I would have to go through to get licensed in another country, I might have to go back to school from day one in their program. So I I don't think, I don't see myself doing that. So you have to go to a local Portugal school to get acupuncture license again? In Portugal, no, but I don't think my license may or may not be transferable. I haven't really looked it through yet because my Portuguese is not at the level where I could get a license in Portugal. I have to speak, I have to pass a language test. Got it. In order to speak it in order to work in Portugal. In Nepal, you did have to go to a Nepali school to get a license in Nepal. Um, so it's different in, from country to country but it's not a transferable license. Yoga doesn't need a license. So yoga is something I can still do and teach. Well, I'm sure you're gonna continue the work, you know, Mm -hmm. and God's not done using you yet. (laughs) I'm sure about that. (laughs) Not much I know. (laughs) You know, wherever we go, it's an opportunity to do the work for sure. And I know there's no shortage of the work there. Um, the Paul came up in my last podcast message. So when you said that, it just automatically clicked. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe about four or five episodes ago, I had a Portuguese, um, a Portuguese native who came, whose whose parents came over. So. Uh, Portugal's coming up right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, and it's all about the work, you know. If you can spread the word, I I appreciate it and um, connect me to some people. But um, I I appreciate you taking the time today. Sure. I definitely want you to be a friend of the show. Yeah, I feel connected from doing this. So that's that's really good to have that impact that you're having, that you have that impact on people that are on the show with you. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, the, the listenership, I'm sure we'll get there one day, but we're not there yet. And so much of the strongest interaction is with the guests. So it's me and the guests spreading the word, you know, and little by little with social media, we'll keep doing things. Mm-hmm. So let me know when you come back to the States. Okay. And um, if if you're not down this way, I'll definitely come up to the city. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'll let you know. Yeah. Continue to stay safe. Keep your mask mask (laughs) on. 
I do, believe me, even after I go to the States and get my vaccination, I will still be wearing a mask. <laughs> yep. Oh, Wendy, stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexi. It's so good that you're doing this. I, I'm enjoying it and I feel good from having done it too. Yes. So. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. You too.